good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar, especially for our colleagues in Latin America and Asia who are joining us really early or late. My name is Dr. Suzy Nikiema, and I'm the lead of Sustainable Investment Workstream at ISD. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar and to introduce our estimated speakers joining us today. Today, we will discuss what happens to pre-existing bilateral investment treaties between two state parties once they enter into a mega regional agreements or multilateral treaties, what we are referring to in short as intra-DITs. In addition, some regions like the European Union have also addressed their intra-DITs outside the context of a regional instrument negotiations. We'll explore the different approaches taken by various economic blocks when it's come to addressing intra-DITs and assess its implications for investment governance coherence. For those of you who, just, who were just with us in Abuja, Nigeria, early this month for the ISD 14th Annual Forum of Developing Countries Investment Negotiators, you may recall that the forum theme this year was coherence in international investment governance, crafting a holistic approach to investment that works for sustainable development. Indeed, how countries address intra-BITs amongst them once a new instrument comes into force is a very important and timely topic, given the need to bring, among other layers, coherence within the complex network of existing bilateral investment treaties. The design and entry into force of various regional agreements in recent years reveals variations in how countries are approaching this issue. And this is why we decided to host this webinar today. Each approach represents specific policy and legal implications and raises some fundamental questions that negotiators need to be aware of, but also learn from. We are very pleased to have this with us today representative from Latin America, Asia, AU, and Africa. We will begin this webinar with a presentation by Dr. Stephanie Schraheher, followed it by an exciting panel discussion. Dr. Stephanie Schraheher is an assistant professor of law at the Singapore Management University, who teaches, researches, and practices in the field of international or of public international law, EU law, and international trade and investment law. She has widely published on these topics. We also have the privilege at ISD to work with Dr. Stephanie on various specific projects on investment treaties and negotiation reforms. We are really honored uh, to have her with us today. We, also, uh, we are also honored to be joined by four eminent experts. First, Dr. Yaroslav Kutner, who is the head of the International Arbitration and Investment Protection Unit at the Ministry of Finance of the Czech Republic. He defends the Republic in investment arbitrations, negotiates bids on its behalf, and represents its country in international forum. And prior to join the ministry, he worked as an associate in the International Arbitration Group of White and Case in New York. We also have Mrs. Vanessa Rivas Plata, serves as president of a special commission representing the Rep Republic of Peru in international investment disputes. Prior to her current position, Mrs. Rivas Plata acted as investment affairs coordinator at the Ministry of Foreign Trade, having participated as lead investment negotiator of multiple international investment agreements, including the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, as well as FTAs with uh, several FTAs with investment chapters. We also have Mrs. Juanita Rushiat with us. She is a senior officer and trade expert of, for investment in the ASEAN Secretariat, overseeing all investment negotiations and cooperation under ASEAN. She's a trade expert specializing in regional services and investment cooperation and negotiations. She was part of the ASEAN Secretariat team who services the negotiations of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP, one of the largest FTAs in the world, and saw it through the conclusion and signing. Last but not least, we have Dr. Tokmo Shidede with us. He is an investment expert with the Directorate of Trade in Services, Investment, Intellectual Property Rights, and Digital Trade at the IFCFTA Secretariat. 
He has advised on international investment law, international trade law, African regional economic integration, and international arbitration. He's serving at the ICFTA uh, on supporting the ongoing negotiation of the ICFTA protocol on investment and are one of the largest FTA in the world. And he's representing today Mrs. Emilu Burundoria, the director of the above mentioned directorate, who was unfortunately unable to join us due to conflict engagements, including, for those who don't know, the FCFTA Council of Ministers meeting that is happening today. So I think you can agree with me that we have an excellent and perfect panel to have this discussion today with experts who really participated in concrete negotiation and who have all the knowledge to unpack the issue today with us. My sincere thank to each of you for making your time available to join us today. And following our panel discussion, we'll take some questions from the floor. Please do share your questions and reflection in the chat at any time. I will now hand over to my colleague Nyaguti Maina, who will be moderating this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. A very good afternoon to you all. And thank you, Susie, for giving us a great introduction and overview on what we will be discussing today, as well as introducing our eminent speakers. My name is Nyaguti Maina, a law advisor with IISD. Uh, before we get into our discussion, Stephanie will give us an introductory presentation, which sets the scene for our panel. She will help clarify the terminology and concept of intra-BITs, shed light on scenarios where countries have had existing treaties versus none before negotiating a mega-regional agreement. She will also help clarify negotiations that are still ongoing and where, where they have been concluded, as well as clarify scenarios where a new instrument has replaced intra-BITs and where it hasn't. We will then have our dynamic panel of experts unpack the various approaches taken by their respective regions when it comes to addressing intra-BITs. There'll be two rounds of panel discussions before we open the floor for Q&A. So as Susie mentioned, please do share your questions and reflections in the chat at any time. And my colleagues uh, Abbas and Lucas will be collecting them and taking note of them during the session. So over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Nguti, and thank you, um, Susie, for this very kind introduction. And good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all the participants. It is a tremendous pleasure to be speaking on an ISD event, and it's an honor for me to set the scene of this important discussion. And I think that I will remind uh, the distinguished audience of things that they already know, but to set the scene and to kick off the discussion, I'm um, delighted to do so. And I have three points that I would like to highlight in particular. The first one is what is the rationale behind regional investment uh, treaties? And before then going into the modalities and the consequences of terminating intra-regional BITs, and as a third step, the consequences of not terminating intra-regional BITs. So if we take a step back and question why regional economic blocks adopt investment agreements, one of the first major objectives is to boost in intra-regional FDI. And so, for example, in the context of the African continental free trade area, this is very much discussed because intra-African investment promises high economic growth rates in the continent. Another objective of regional approaches to FDI regulation is to attract extra-regional FDI. And so here the idea is that with a common set of rules, the regional bloc becomes more attractive. And this argument is very often used by ASEAN, highlighting that a common investment regime makes the region more attractive at the global level. In addition, and to complicate a little bit the landscape, is that regional integration organizations generally have a wider set of other policy objectives. And this can include the sustainable development goals, sustainable development in general. And so we have a need here to align FDI uh, regulation with these objectives. 
Consequently, we witnessed the adoption of uh, mega regional trade and investment agreements and more investment instruments by regional blocks. And so the key question that is underlining between to terminate or not to terminate is really how to better achieve these regional objectives. Is it desirable to consolidate and terminate um, certain the intra-regional BITs or are other alternatives to termination also desirable and feasible? Let me now come to the first uh, point on the modalities and consequences of terminating uh, intra-regional BITs. So a first modality of action is of course to replace the intra-regional BIT by substituting it with a new regional treaty. Here, the new investment agreement um, is concluded by the treaty partners of the given economic bloc, and it is then replacing arguably an outdated treaty. A good example, a recent example of replacement is the US MCA, which replaced uh, NAFTA and Chapter 11 in particular and allowed the United States, Mexico and Canada to change the provisions on FET and ISDS according to their new policy imperatives. Now, you might say that the USMCA is a very specific case, and indeed, the scenario that is more common is that a new regional treaty or a mega regional treaty is adopted among states that have a number of existing BITs already among them. And so here, termination would mean a form of consolidation. It would mean the abrogation of several pre-existing treaties and replacing them with a single treaty or with one single legal framework, which would be more appropriate to say, in particular in the context of the European Union. So consolidation from an economic integration perspective is certainly a very effective way because we would have one um, framework that is applicable to FDI. From the perspective of creating a coherent FDI regime and thereby enhancing the attractiveness for third country investors, consolidation also appears to be beneficial. And if we take it from an international investment agreement reform perspective, consolidation has even two positive effects. On the one hand, modernization of the treaty um, content can be achieved and we reduce this fragmentation of the IIA network globally. But then if we think about it, where real consolidation is actually happening in which of the regions, the only real consolidation is taking place in the intra-European context where we have very clear and binding um, statements from the Court of Justice made in 2018 that intra-EU bids basically are contrary to EU law and the EU internal market. And as many of you know, the EU member states have a termination agreement from May 2020 purporting to terminate over 130 intra-EU BITs. So here a real consolidation is taking place. Now, interestingly, MEGA regionals, and I take here the example of RCEP, the re Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that is in the region where I am in the Asia Pacific, is illustrative because ASEAN, who was the main initiator behind RCEP, praises the agreement as an agreement that would consolidate, go so back in consolidate, these numerous overlapping agreements between individual ASEAN member states and between ASEAN and the other five RCEP partners. But in reality, RCEP does not terminate any of the existing treaties and it establishes a, a situation of parallel and overlapping treaty commitments. So in general, it is safe to say that most of the recent mega regionals or regional international investment agreements have missed the opportunity for consolidation. So what we have instead is this parallel application of new and old treaties. And so let me come to my third and last point then on the consequences of, of not terminating intra-regional 
BITs. Obviously, if you have an overlapping um, network of commitment, it creates complexity and inconsistency. Not terminating can undermine the reform and it can have the impact that the newer, more modern, potentially more sustainable development oriented treaty will not be the one that is invoked by investors or that is actually applied in an ISDS. If there exists multiple overlapping treaty relationships between individual member states of a given economic bloc, foreign investors may be in a position to treaty shop. Yeah, so we have the risk of treaty shopping, of picking and choosing the IIA that offers the more favorable treatment um, to them and both in terms of substantive as well as access to ISDS. So the question, the last question then that arises, if we have overlapping commitment, how do we manage these overlapping commitments? And some of the treaties um, include conflict clauses. So to manage the overlapping treaty relationship, we could typically have a clause that would prioritize the newer treaty over the older, but we also find clauses that prioritize the treaty that is more favorable to the foreign investor. Other treaties, such as the CPTPP, adopt a default approach of parallelism, and they grant a sort of flexibility to the parties to decide between themselves if they want to terminate or not. In the CPTPP context, Australia, for example, managed to um, agree to terminate its BITs with Mexico, Peru and Vietnam upon the entry into force of the treaty. So to conclude, obviously, the extent to which termination of an intra-regional BIT or BITs is pursued very much depends on the level of integration and this then links to the fact to the competences of the economic bloc in question um, and to what extent the member states still remain um, in their sovereign position to continue to conclude uh, BITs or to keep them as if they prefer. And it also depends on the configuration of the bloc, meaning I would argue that the number of countries that are in the regional bloc are actually um, important. If we have a setting like in North America with only three countries, this is a different configuration than um, more than 50 countries in Africa. So with these very brief uh, introductory uh, comments, I hand it back to Anir Guti and I look forward uh, to our discussion. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, that was great in helping our audience uh, understand the concept, the rationale, and the different uh, categorizations and different approaches adopted in the various uh, mega regional agreements. And I think you've also touched upon some of the consequences which we'll unpack um, in this webinar. So each speaker with us today has a wealth of experience and in-depth understanding of treaty negotiations, and each from a different perspective. So to begin in about six minutes, uh, could each of you please take us through the key facts of the agreement or agreements you will be speaking about, the number of countries who entered into it and approach that was taken to address uh, intra-BITs. And as a follow-up, um, were there any specificities or considerations at the time that influenced the approach that you took? And I think I would like to start with Dr. Yaroslav if you could uh, kick us off for this first round of uh, discussion. With pleasure, uh, Nayaguti, and uh, good afternoon from Prague to all of you. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to participate in this webinar. And before I start, I just need to know that the views expressed here are only mine and should not be attributed uh, to the Ministry of Finance of the Czech Republic. So I will have uh, the pleasure to tackle the intra-regional BITs experience uh, in the EU, and uh, I will do so particularly from the Czech Republic uh, perspective. So as a way uh, of introduction, the European Union now has 27 member states, and after the enlargement in 2004, it covers both Western and Eastern Europe. 
The EU's key feature is the single market with the following four fundamental freedoms. Free movement of persons, goods, capital, and freedom to establish and provide services. The EU member states also accord nationals of other member states the same treatment regarding participation in the capital of companies. A part of the treaties, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union also granted the intra-EU investors certain rights, including the right to conduct business, the right to property, uh, equality before the law, and non-discrimination. Now, concerning the BITs, there were a number of BITs between Western and Eastern European countries. Most of these Eastern European countries joined the EU in 2004, but the question of BITs was not dealt with during the accession process. In fact, a number of Western countries uh, supported the existence of these investment treaties and wanted them to continue to protect their investments in the Eastern Europe. EU law contains a general rule and general conflict rule in Article 351 TFEU that agreements concluded with third states before the accession are not affected. And if there is an incompatibility with EU treaties, the member states need to eliminate those. But the issue was that there was no agreement at the time of the accession on such incompatibility. This being said, I would like to highlight that there were calls for the termination of the intra-UBITs uh, already back then. For example, the government of the Czech Republic issued a resolution in May of 2005, about a year after we joined the EU, calling for the termination of the intra-UBITs. The explanatory report uh, from the time explained that the BITs played a role in the 90s during the transformation of our economy and the development of legal uh, environment to attract foreign investment. And according to the report, this development was mainly achieved with our entry to the European Union, and thus there was no need for uh, the intra-EU BITs anymore. In 2006, uh, the EU authorities advised the Czech Republic on a couple of occasions that it should terminate the intra-EU BITs, there was, however, no express mention of incompatibility of arbitration clauses with EU law. The conflict between investment arbitration and EU law materialized soon after in an uh, arbitration uh, award from March 2007 in the Eastern Sugar case. The Czech Republic raised the intra-EU objection based on its accession to the EU. The tribunal noted that despite the letters, the European Commission has actually never started any infringement proceedings against the state that had failed to terminate the intra-UBITs, which in its opinion showed the lack of any incompatibility. Concerning the argument based on Article 59 uh, of the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties that a later treaty replaces an earlier treaty when they cover the same subject matter and are incompatible, the tribunal disagreed with the e that the EU treaties and the BIT had the same subject matter. The tribunal noted that on one hand, the EU treaties were providing for fundamental freedoms and were mainly concerned, concerned with the investor's right to invest in the Czech Republic. On the other hand, the BIT focused, uh, according to the tribunal, on protecting the investment during its life. The crucial protection was access to investment arbitration, which the tribunal described as, I quote, the best guarantee that the investment will be protected against potential undue infringements by the host state. The Czech Republic also asked the tribunal to refer the intra-EU BIT issue to the European Court of Justice. But the tribunal decided there was no need to refer this question to the ECJ in a case where the answer is not difficult. The tribunal also observed that the possibility of referral to the European Court of Justice is a route not open to an arbitrary tribunal, even if it has a seat in the European Union. And the intra-EU objection was thus um, uh, rejected uh, already in this case, relatively early after our accession to the EU. We had to wait until 2016 
um, so more than 10 years, when the German court sent such a preliminary question to the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union in the ACMEA case, which was uh, referred to by Stefani in the introduction. Despite the failure of the intra-EU objection at that time, the Czech Republic was able to terminate by a mutual agreement, the BITs with uh, another nine member states. But the other member states refused or did not react to the Czech Republic's proposal to terminate the BITs. And uh, this is not surprising because for example, a report issued by the Economic and Financial Committee of the EU in December, 2008, stated, I quote, most member states did not share the commission's concern in respect of arbitration risks and discriminant treatment of investors, and a clear majority of member states preferred to maintain the existing agreements. The European Commission only stepped up its pressure in 2015 with the start of infringement proceedings against the Netherlands, Austria, Romania, Slovakia, and Sweden for the incompatibility of the intra-EU BITs with EU law, and the Commission requested their termination. At the time, uh, the European Commission also started an EU pilot procedure with the Czech Republic regarding the same issue. However, the real change in regard to the intra-EU BITs only came in March 2018 with the ACMEA decision of the European, uh, uh, European Court of Justice, where the court declared the arbitration clauses in the BIT between Czechoslovakia and the Netherlands incompatible with EU law. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yaroslav. And you've really um, helped uh, give the audience a sense of uh, the journey of the EU and the Czech Republic um, in addressing this issue. Um, Stephanie touched a bit about um, the difference between the EU and ASEAN, and maybe I'd like to turn to you, Ioannita, uh, if you'd give us um, your perspective. And then perhaps after that, we'll have Vanessa and talk more. Ioannita. Yeah, thank you, Naguti. Um, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, or good afternoon. Yeah, I'm Ioannita Ruyat from ASEAN Secretariat. And in this context, I think I'll be talking about ASEAN uh, more as a regional bloc instead of uh, individual ASEAN member states, because um, yeah, we do, maybe unlike uh, European Union, we have uh, different settings here as, um, so uh, each member state does have um, their own sovereignty in terms of having uh, their own BIT and uh, trade agreements as well. So yes, so I'll be only speaking about uh, in the context of regional bloc. So um, in ASEAN, uh, usually we can categorize our uh, agreements perhaps into, uh, into faults, those for internal ASEAN, uh, intra-ASEAN, and then uh, among 10 member states and those uh, for external, which is ASEAN plus its trade partners. So for in terms of internal ASEAN, in the case of um, investment, we have uh, what we call um, ASEAN Comprehensive Inter uh, in Agreement on Investment or sometimes called AKIA. And this is, uh, maybe we cannot call it, uh, we don't usually use the term BIT in ASEAN, I mean, among ASEAN. Uh, but this uh, AKIA, normally we call it, uh, it's similar to international um, investment treaties. And the other uh, category is the uh, external uh, ASEAN uh, agreements, which is ASEAN plus its uh, trade partners. So uh, in terms of this, normally we also do not have independent uh, international or independent um, ASEAN investment treaties with certain um, uh, partners, it's usually come in the ambit of an FTA. So for example, uh, we in ASEAN have around uh, eight, um, eight um, free trade agreements. Seven of them are ASEAN plus one, which is ASEAN plus one country or two. Um, so it's with China, um, India, Japan, Korea, um, and 
one with uh, Australia and New Zealand as a block. And the, the eighth one is, of course, the mega regional RCEP. Um, so for uh, the plus one agreement, normally it comes, so the, the, the investment agreement uh, does, it never comes uh, uh, outside the uh, ambit of the FTA. Normally, they will start with uh, having a mother trade agreements between them. Uh, between, uh, and then after that, uh, for example, like um, China, India, uh, Korea, it, it starts with a framework uh, economic comprehensive agreement and then it follows with uh, sectoral uh, agreements such as uh, trade uh, trade uh, in phases in stages so it's um, trade agreements and then uh, maybe next phase is the services and investment agreement will follow after that um, and then we the first time ASEAN has this um, single undertaking trade agreements is with uh, Australia and New Zealand where it um, it was it was done uh, under uh, sing, in single undertaking in one go and it was concluded sometimes in 2009, I think. Um, and then also we had another question like, uh, for example, the, the ASEAN Japan, where the mother agreement actually uh, was crafted or was drafted uh, in, in single undertaking, but the implementation or negotiation itself was done um, in in phases. So, uh, and then, but it's uh, the investment part, for example, is put not uh, as a, as a, a standalone agreement, but under um, chapter uh, under the uh, ASEAN Japan uh, pre trade. And also, of course, uh, uh, do, uh, I think after the signing of um, ASEAN ANSFATA in 2008, and also at that time, uh, in response to the emerging issue at that time, of course, the proclamation of the pre trade agreement, ASEAN uh, response. Uh, with the idea of having uh, merging the all of uh, ASEAN FTA, first it was the idea was having a three ASEAN plus three, which is ASEAN Japan Korea China, and then uh, followed by why don't why not having it the six of them together, and then uh, finally uh, it, it it's and it with the launching of the uh, ASEAN negotiation back in 2012 and of 2012. Yes, but so I think it's respond to your um, second question on the um, at the approach that was taken uh, to the address the pre persisting intra regional BITs uh, or investment treat treat treaties. Uh, yeah, as as rightly point out, pointed out by Stephanie, ASEAN uh, did not um, ASEAN never have uh, has been consistent in allowing COE six coexistence with its uh, uh, ASEAN plus one FTAs or also with intra-regional. So it's still ineffective. Not, uh, no, no agreement was uh, ever terminated, plus, plus one. I think uh, the reason behind that is more because um, first, uh, we, we do realize that our FTA partners has a different level of um, uh, different level of economic economic development, also different level of interest and different level of sensitivity, and it might come up with. Uh, I mean, consolidation could have some challenges, and I think uh, at that time the decision also to to not terminate the plus one agreements or even uh, it's because. We want to preserve uh, the commitments or benefits that are already being enjoyed in the ASEAN Plus One because this is normally like like I told you earlier, um, if investment treaty doesn't really uh, st uh, stands on its own is part of the overall FTAs, and also it uh, we uh, the consideration is also giving business businesses more options. Uh, to 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 choose uh, the benefit from, and yes, to also answer perhaps uh, um, Stephanie's um, point on the treaty shopping, 
especially for our SDS, yeah, I think uh, that is uh, what could be right. But the thing is, uh, for RCEP, for example, uh, currently doesn't have ISDS provision. So, um, but it has um, the market access, I mean, schedules for investment because RCEP is the first um, FTA that ASEAN has, ASEAN plus one, uh, I mean, ASEAN plus FTA with trade markets that has uh, investment schedules, uh, investment reservations and uh, non-confirming measures, uh, while the other uh, do not have at the moment. Um, um, so, and um, but it doesn't have ISDS uh, uh, provision. So I think um, if we terminate the ASEAN plus one at that time, and maybe I, I'm not sure why my predecessor also, with they already, uh, it would, it could have uh, that consequences also for the, um, how do you say, uh, the, the investor to lose their uh, opportunity to, to um, yeah, to, to have claims for ISDS because RCEP itself doesn't have uh, ISDS provision at this point in time. Uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe that's for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yonita. And, and uh, I'm glad you've kind of alluded to our next round of questions um, addressing the implications of the approach that ASEAN has taken. So we'll get into that in a bit more detail in the next round of questions. Um, I can see there's some questions coming in. I would like to encourage the participants, please continue uh, sending in your questions and also to encourage the panelists to look at the Q&A box. Um, there are some questions addressed to you. Uh, Vanessa, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nyaguti. Uh, and well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all uh, participants. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank um, the organizers for inviting me to this webinar. I am deeply grateful for the invitation, and it is a, an honor to share this panel with uh, such distinguished speakers. Uh, as always, I uh, must start by um, stating that uh, the views to be expressed are only mine and should not be attributed to the Republic of Peru nor should bind it in any ongoing or future um, investment arbitration. Um, I will focus today on the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the CPTPP, a free trade agreement involving 12 countries in the Asia-Pacific region, including New Zealand, Australia, Brunei, Jerusalem, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam. And as you are aware, the United States uh, was part of these negotiations at the very early beginning of it. Um, by the time that uh, TPP negotiations were initiated, Peru had in place investment legal frameworks within uh, trade agreements with six out of the 12 treaty partners involved in the, this regional agreement. Uh, the countries with which Peru has never had a free trade agreement with were Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Um, prior to the negotiations, Peru consistently replaced its all uh, generation bilateral investment treaties with modern investment uh, chapters and their free trade agreements. And here, I would like to um, emphasize that Peru embarked on um, a, gen uh, a reform of its economy back in the 90s decades. The negotiation of uh, bilateral investment treaties was certainly part of uh, its policy took it to attract uh, foreign investors and foreign investments. Uh, this all uh, bilateral investment treaties responded to a particular uh, historic, economic, and social context. Um, so after the, the negotiations of these bilateral investment treaties, Peru embarked on the negotiation of trade agreements. Uh, these free trade agreements included investment uh, legal frameworks, but also frameworks uh, for market access uh, for goods and services, 
intellectual property, environmental provisions, um, and other um, trade related provisions. Um, Peru uh, consistently replaced these older uh, generation VATs and included a conflict rule, uh, stating that the termination of these relevant bilateral investment treaties, as well as the termination of, of all the rights and obligations derived from the said uh, treaty on the date of entry into force of um, the new um, treaty. A model termination clause included by Peru reads as follows. Any and all investments made pursuant to the bilateral investment treaty before the entry into force of this agreement will be governed by the rules of the said treaty regarding any measure arising while the treaty was in force. An investor may only submit an arbitration claim pursuant to the bilateral investment treaty regarding any measure arising while the said treaty was in force, pursuant to the rules and procedures established in it, provided that no more than three years have elapsed since the date of entry into force of this agreement. So when we started the uh, negotiations, uh, there were a major, uh, major policy questions to be addressed in terms of uh, its structure and its relationship with uh, previous treaties, um, um, particularly with pre prior um, investment uh, legal frameworks within free trade agreement. The questions that uh, were um, asked by then were, would this mega regional treaty coexist with pre-existing intra-regional VITs? Would this would it terminate the existing intra-regional VITs or would this new legal framework coexist with these uh, regional uh, treaties? And those questions uh, were not answered until a very late stage in the negotiations as the CPTPP contained provisions uh, regarding a wide range of policy areas including uh, intellectual property, market access in goods, and certainly investment. Uh, parties involved in this negotiation had to assess whether the outcome of uh, the new treaty as a whole package uh, was beneficial to their national interest. So when we are asked about the considerations that we had bear in mind uh, to respond to the policy question on whether a country intends to replace old bilateral investment treaties, uh, intra-regional bilateral investment treaties with a new um, treaty, a modern um, investment treaty. Uh, there are policy questions that need to be answered first. Uh, certainly a country must um, assess what is um, the outcome that it intends to obtain in the context of the new negotiations? And certainly what are the whether the national interests are addressed in that new uh, negotiation. In terms of investment provisions, um, we had to, in the context of the CPTPP negotiations, we had to bear in mind that it was very uh, likely that the new treaty uh, was going to coexist with pre-existing um, investment treaties. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, that policy uh, decision was not made until the very end of the negotiation. Uh, so while we were negotiating, we were uh, thinking whether we had to address in the context of the investment provision, certain rules to address this coexistence. Um, as you um, are familiar with um, ISDS and the consequences or unanticipated consequences of investment negotiations in the context of ISDS, um, all negotiators uh, were very clear that some specific rules were needed to be addressed in this um, investment chapter under the CPTPP. Um, so some considerations on treaty drafting were adopted the first uh, issue to be addressed was, how can we achieve clarity both substantively and procedurally in our investment treaty obligations? 
how should we address the issue of unanticipated consequences in the context of ISDS? For instance, how can we address the risk of parallel proceedings initiated by a foreign investors under various treaties? How can we prevent uh, scenarios of treaty shopping or cherry picking? Uh, preventing these situations in which an investor, foreign investor triggers an ISDS claim under a treaty, invoking um, more advantageous IIA standards from another treaty. In order to address um, those treaty drafting questions, uh, we had to uh, go through issues, uh, various issues from the scope and content of the investment treaties to provide further clarity and guidance on the uh, scope, contours, and limitations of um, the investment provisions. Um, another legislative technique that was introduced in the context of the CPTPP negotiations was the use of exceptions, curve outs, non-conforming measures, and various uh, procedural safeguards. Um, so all these um, treaty drafting um, issues were uh, taken into consideration once the major policy question was answered. And um, again, that policy question was um, answered at the very uh, latest stage of the negotiation. But we as negotiators had already discussed how to address conflict rules, how to provide further clarity uh, in the context of these investment treaties to avoid unanticipated consequences in the context of ISDS. Um, so I will pause uh, for now, and in the second round of my intervention, I uh, will um, make some points regarding the specific issues that uh, were a challenge in the CPTPP negotiation and how we could overcome uh, these challenges. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, um, and for sh uh, shedding light on the policy questions and the considerations that you had to um, confront and um, uh, during the negotiations. So I'm to turn to talk more who's currently involved in a current negotiation, and I'm sure these are similar uh, questions and considerations on the table. So um, the floor is yours to share with us uh, what's happening at the AFCFTA negotiations. Thank you very much, Yaguti. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Perfect. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, distinguished participants. Um, my name is Tokmo Chilele. So I'm an investment expert at the AFCFTA Secretariat. Uh, let me first start by thanking IISD uh, for organizing this webinar and also inviting the AFCFTA Secretariat to, to participate. Um, and personally, it is an honor to be part of this esteemed um, panel. Um, my, my presentation uh, will focus on the protocol on investment uh, to the FCFT agreement, which is negotiated between and among 55 member states of the African Union. Um, this protocol will form an integral part of the FCFT agreement upon adoption and um, part of the single undertaking of the agreement um, upon entry into, into force. Um, it is our hope that this today and tomorrow, so the Council of Ministers responsible for trade are meeting um, to finalize and approve the, the protocol on investment and there is an extraordinary summit for the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union scheduled for scheduled um, towards the end of the of next month. So we are hoping that um, the Assembly will adopt these protocols and then they form an integral part of the of the agreement. Uh, let me first start by um, highlighting some of the key objectives of the of the protocol. So it is a draft uh, protocol that we have at the moment. Um, so the main objectives in this draft protocol is to, to boost intra-Africa investment and uh, trade uh, in, in accordance with the overall objectives of the AFCFTA uh, agreement. 
so the protocol seeks to protect, to promote, facilitate um, intra Africa investors and the investment. And perhaps more important to uh, in the context of this discussion is the protocol um, intends to to establish a coherent continental legal framework for investment in in, in Africa. Um, it is also important to, to, to mention that maybe the context of Africa, um, the configuration of the, of the, of the region is, is different from what has been mentioned in other, by my fellow panelists in other regions, um, in the sense that the, the protocol on investment is a continental legal framework, but it is established in a very complex legal and regulatory framework where with different levels of legal instruments um, concluded at the regional level. So within the continent, we do have sub-regional um, uh, communities, sub-regional groups, where African regional economic communities that have also um, concluded regional investment agreements we also have bilateral investment treaties that have been concluded between African countries and in, uh, bilateral investment treaties that have been concluded between African states and non-African states. And also to mention that we are uh, quite a number of countries, almost all the countries also have national legislation with uh, transnational application, which applies to both foreign and um, investment agreements. So this is the context within which the, this continental legal framework for investment is being negotiated. And um, at the regional level, uh, we, we have a mixture of uh, a combination of binding and non-binding legal instruments. So in terms of binding legal instruments, we um, a few of the regional economic communities, uh, particularly COMESA, um, SADC, ECOWAS, they do have regional investment agreements that are binding um, to, but are, that are binding to the members of those specific region and other regions, for example, EAC, they have um, concluded uh, or adopted model treaties, which are meant to guide the, the members of that regional economic community when they are negotiating uh, investment treaties, be it among themselves or with uh, third parties. Um, coming to, to bilateral investment treaties, so there is quite a number of, there are quite a number of bilateral investment treaties in terms of the statistics by, um, by UNCTAD, uh, African countries in total, they have concluded um, over 1,000, about 1,018 bilateral investment treaties. And of those bilateral investment treaties, 319 um, inter-African bilateral investment treaties. And the rest, um, um, the rest are between African countries and non-African countries. And looking at the the entry into force, about ninety three of the inter Africa bilateral investment treaties are are in force, and some they remain uh, unsigned or unratified. Um, and the, the the context, the content of the most of the bilateral investment treaties um, still old generation bilateral investment treaties, and we have done a study where we are mapping the existing regional and bilateral investment treaties in Africa uh, prior to to the negotiations of the um, protocol on investment, and um, what has come out of that mapping exercise is. In as much as there's more, um, there are more convergences in in these existing bilateral investment treaties. There's uh, there's a significant divergences in 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 most areas, which um, uh, which causes some inconsistencies, uh, overlaps, duplication, and also poses a risk of um, treaty and forum uh, shopping and. In essence, this undermines the, the objectives that I've I outlined, um, the objectives of the protocol to establish a continental legal framework, a coherent legal framework across the continent, and also undermines the attractiveness of the, the continent when we do have overlapping uh, regulations or rules when it comes to, to, to investment. Um, coming, um, so just to address how the, the protocol on investment, uh, the draft protocol that we have, how it intends to address the the existence, the coexistence of the protocol itself, the protocol on investment, 
and the existing regional and bilateral investment treaties. So we have um, a three-tier approach. Um, so the first approach is to address how do we address intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties. The second approach is how do we address intra um, intra regional investment agreements. So the regional investment agreements concluded under the auspices of the regional economic communities. And um, third, um, how do we deal with the relationship between the, the coexistence of the protocol on investment and the bilateral investment treaties concluded with third parties. So um, the first one, uh, so there is a proposal to terminate um, intra-bilateral investment treaties within five years of the entry into force of the protocol. So the termination also includes the termination of sunset clauses or survival clauses of those bilateral investment treaties. And having um, also noticed that it's it's not enough only to 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 deal with existing bilateral investment treaties, uh, intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties. We also need to charter um, a predictable um, way forward when it comes to the intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties. So the proposal is also to to prohibit um, state parties to conclude future. Uh, bilateral investment treaties among themselves, such that we have uh, a coherent uh, legal framework, one uniform legal framework across the continent that governs investment um, investment relations between the state parties of the AFCFTA. Um, the third, the second, the second um, aspect is how do we deal with um, regional investment agreements. So in this one, there is a more lenient uh, approach. Um, so instead of terminating regional investment treaties, the approach uh, that is proposed is to, to um, perhaps amend and revise, uh, to revise, review and amend the regional investment uh, treaties. I'll come back to, to, to explain why, why such approach when it comes to regional investment um, agreements. So this, proposal to review and amend is uh, within a period of five to 10, between five to 10 years after the entry into force. Then the third approach to investment agreements or bilateral investment agreements with third parties is to perhaps uh, encourage the member states, the best in the language to encourage member states to take into account the requirements of the protocol or use the protocol on investment as a model uh, when they are negotiating the, the, the protocol on, on investment. Um, so why did we uh, approach what informed the approach for terminating intra-bilateral, intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties? So um, one of the main um, um, legal question that we had to answer was the, to take into account international, customer international law rules in particular, Article 54 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which requires states, the contracting states to, to consent to the termination of bilateral investment treaties. So since the state parties are the parties to the protocol, and they are also parties to the intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties, so they have to consent. So in them agreeing to such a provision within the protocol, that's expressed of consent that they intend to, to terminate the existing intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties and also consent that they will not in the future agree or negotiate um, any bilateral investment treaty uh, between themselves. And um, why, why then the approach is different when it comes to third party bilateral investment treaties and regional investment treaties? Um, Maybe uh, let me let me say that the in Africa we are not uh, we are different. The African legal setting, especially when it comes to regional integration, is different from the European Union. We in Africa we don't have supranational um, legal system or supranational institutions where maybe the AFCFTA Secretariat or the African Union negotiates uh, on behalf of everyone. So the state parties in their individual or sovereign right, they negotiate, they come and the process is member state driven. So the member states still retain their processes. And also to mention that 
the regional economic communities are not party to the FCFT arrangement. They are recognized as where the FCFT, the FTAs of the RECs are recognized as the, the building blocks of the, of the FCFT. So the RECs in their legal personality or in their own right are not parties to the FCFT. Therefore, the protocol to the FCFT agreement cannot create legally binding um, uh, obligations on the on the RECs. However, the influence perhaps to to in, in sorry in, sorry Topmo, I'll need I'll need to cut you. Uh, we we are really running out of time. Um, but if you can maybe tie it into the next. Okay, let's let's let, let me yeah. just wrap up. So okay. that that uh, so since the state parties are also members of those RECs, so it's a way of encouraging them that in order for us to have a a, a coherent legal framework across the continent, let's perhaps. Uh, go back to our regional economic communities and revise and try to align whatever that we have in the regional economic communities to the protocol on investment and the same way that we don't have the protocol does not create legally binding um, obligations on third parties state parties that are negotiating with, third, with um, third parties they also have to take into account or use um, some of the requirements of the provisions of the protocol as a basis in them negotiating with the, the third parties Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, I really want to acknowledge and appreciate you being so informative on what's happening and the uh, and current negotiations uh, with the AFCFT. I think that has been very useful for everybody who's joined us today. So thank you, talk more. Um, I'll be a bit more strict with the next round because we're running out of time and we really should uh, take some questions, Q&A. Um, so, uh, Drawing from your varying experiences, what have been two key challenges and one opportunity or lesson learned in your respective region with the approach taken um, to addressing intra-BITs? Um, and in addition, maybe uh, you, if you can address also where relevant, what also needs to be in place at the domestic and regional level for the type of approach uh, to be effective? So I will give you five, four or five minutes each um, to be as succinct as possible um, and we can just uh, start again with you, Yaroslav, and then um, the next uh, panelists. Of course, uh, thank you. So I think, uh, as I have already mentioned, the first binding decision on the compatibility of the intra-UBITs with EU law was the 2018 ACMEA decision. But uh, this decision actually has also created some challenges as there was, for example, no guidance on what should happen with the pending cases. So I would like to first um, at least briefly discuss uh, the investment tribunal's reaction to this uh, ACMEA decision in the cases against the Czech Republic, which were pending at the time of the decision. So um, I think a great example is the uh, final holdings versus the Czech Republic, uh, where there is an award from April 2021. And the interesting fact was that this arbitration was actually brought under the same BIT, which was at stake uh, at the ACMA case. So it was the BIT concluded uh, between uh, the Netherlands and Czechoslovakia, which then continued to apply to both Slovakia and the Czech Republic. And the case was seated in the EU. Nevertheless, um, um, the tribunal uh, has uh, stated that uh, it was not bound by the ACMA judgment. And the tribunal further noted that although the ACMA judgment precluded the application of the arbitration clause in the BIT, uh, the court, the European Court, did not rule on the, uh, in ACMA on the procedural consequences of the inapplicability. And the tribunal ruled that the Czech Republic's argument on the interpretation of Article 351 TFA, uh, TFU, which is the conflict rule in the European treaties, um, in favor of the automatic inapplicability of the arbitration clause was not directly supported by the, by the judgment. In fact, the, the tribunal found that the, uh, the conflict rule uh, in Article 351 TFU only imposed an obligation of conduct um, and it could not have been interpreted as a requirement of autom automatic inapplicability. Um, the, um, so so um, the tribunal also 
uh, decided that the EU law did not contain a provision that would generally prohibit arbitration between investors and member states. And on that basis, the tribunal found that the arbitration clause in the BIT was not contrary to EU law. Um, so, uh, in a way, the, there was a certain disconnect between uh, between what the, the European Court said and the and the reaction of the of the tribunals. Now, the reaction of the member states to that uh, decision, the Acme decision, has also not been straightforward. At least uh, the Acme decision changed the position of some member states, which resisted the termination of the intra-UBITs for a long time. But instead of proceeding with a quick uh, and simple termination, the EU member states decided to first negotiate a declaration which would go beyond the Acme decision. And uh, that uh, declaration took a long time to negotiate and created some disagreements. It was finally agreed in January 2019 uh, it, uh, that the BITs will be terminated, but there were in fact three different declarations because the member states could not agree uh, on whether uh, the uh, arbitration clause in the ECT, which is a multilateral uh, energy charter treaty, which the European Union is part, if that uh, should continue to apply or not. And then, uh, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, in May 2020, the member states uh, finally uh, agreed on the termination treaty, and this treaty terminated the majority of the intra-UBITs. Uh, and by this time, the Czech Republic and the most, most uh, EU countries have already ratified. Uh, I think there are uh, uh, two or three countries which uh, have still not done it. Um, and there were also some EU countries which did not want to uh, terminate the treaties by the multilateral treaty. So for example, with uh, Austria, Finland, or Sweden, uh, we have actually negotiated the terminations bilaterally. Um, now, looking at this termination treaty, uh, it uh, stated that the concluded cases will not be reopened. And it also stated that there will be, there should be no new cases started after the ACMEA decision as these arbitration clauses were inapplicable. But concerning the pending cases at the time of the ACMEA decision, this termination agreement required the termination, but offered to investors two transitional measures. The first one was that the investor and the host state could enter into a structured dialogue, which was basically a form of mediation. And the second one was that the investor uh, could bring the case to a national court, but under a domestic or European law. Now, um, I would just like to very briefly comment on whether there were perhaps some alternative ways how to proceed. In one minute. In one minute, yes. So I think my first criticism was that it took more than a year to issue declaration and two years to agree on the termination treaty. And uh, on the contrary, when we did the bilateral termination of BITs, including Santa Claus, it was usually a diplomatic note with, on one page. So I think that if the member states had simply uh, proceeded to just termination of the BIT, that uh, it could have been done in less than two years. And uh, nothing more was really needed because the states would have still raised if they wanted this ACMEA objection, the pending cases. Um, on the, uh, in contrast, the termination treaty tried to deal with these pending cases, which added a lot of uh, complexity without any tangible results because the investor have not really used the alternatives the termination treaty provided. And the result was a prolonged litigation and a lot of money spent by both uh, the investors and the states. Um, and perhaps uh, to finish, right. another challenge was that- I really will have to cut you short, I'm so sorry. Uh, but perhaps if I could encourage you to type in the chat and then maybe try also address it during the Q&A. Um, we're really, really out of time. Um, sorry, sorry to cut you short um, so quickly. Um, maybe you, Anita, if I could turn to you uh, and then Vanessa and talk more. Okay. Thank you, Nyaguti. Okay, uh, for the second round questions, the key challenges uh, with the approach taken um, to address the in, uh, pre-existing intra-BIT. Um, 
So as you know, following the uh, signing and conclusion, conclusion and signing of the RCEP, since we don't terminate the, uh, the ASEAN plus one, but since the conclusion, uh, we ASEAN is embarking in uh, reviewing the uh, the existing ASEAN plus one FTA. Uh, we are we have been negotiating the uh, uh, NZ ASFATA uh, ASEAN Australia New Zealand. Uh, so it's in the current negotiation for the upgrade. And coming up is ASEAN Japan, ASEAN China, ASEAN Japan. Japan and perhaps the other is coming up. So actually, um, I cannot really talk much on the outcome of the uh, all the challenges because it's still ongoing. Um, but perhaps uh, drawing from the experience of the current ongoing um, review of the Aspata uh, upgrade, um, the challenges perhaps is also to maintain. Um, the coherence and consistency of the uh, aligning the RCEP, uh, I mean the RCEP provisions with the uh, existing plus on ANSPATA. Of course, the upgrade is uh, aimed to at least uh, um, align with the RCEP, I mean the level of uh, mission or, and, or perhaps even uh, go beyond the uh, RCEP uh, provisions, but um, uh, there, there, of course, there uh, has been some uh, challenges uh, faced faced by the uh, parties of the uh, plus one ASEAN plus one FTAs because you see the um, the as uh, the RCEP was crafted or uh, was was drafted uh, based on a sensitivity of. Uh, uh, six six participating uh, countries or maybe fifteen at this signatory, but um, so when we are dealing with the reviewing or upgrading the the pre existing uh, agreements such as uh, for example this uh, this time is Answata, sometimes uh, it's also quite difficult to maintain the coherence and consistency because in some point for example some uh, some provisions perhaps uh, heavily negotiated to cater or to uh, accommodate the concerns of other partners. So in case of ASEAN and SPATA, it might not be as important or it might, it could be those, uh, those that are sensitive actually for uh, that particular uh, 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 free trade. So that's why, it's it's quite difficult also for i mean we are having uh, some challenges in in if you want to set like a really uh consistent and um coherent uh provisions or commitments in, in what we have in the mega regional and also in the in 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 the plus one um asean plus one fta but i can uh, i cannot really uh, but to see for line as a receiver lighting actually maybe as a lesson learned uh the 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 experience of having uh, the or the outcome of the rcep itself uh could set up some benchmarks uh that we want to to have in the upgrade of the uh, ASEAN plus one fta and it's also the uh, provides opportunity for uh the for some uh for some commitments that could not be um, materialized when it was in the context of RCEP with other trade partners because of the other partner sensitivity, but they could pursue it. They can have an um, opportunity to pursue it uh, only with ASEAN because, because perhaps it, it is not um, so uh, sensitive with ASEAN, but it's sensitive with other partners that is uh, also uh, parties to RCEP. So I think that's a opportunity or lesson learned that we could uh, gain uh, by not uh, terminating the um, the pre-existing uh, ASEAN Plus One FTA. So we have the opportunity to improve the 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 bilateral. I mean the ASEAN Plus One FTA way more perhaps than the 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 regional uh, the mega regional uh, commitment. Uh, 
yeah, uh, commitment that we have in RCEP. I think uh, maybe that's it for me. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Yonita. Uh, Vanessa, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nyaguti. And uh, I will try to be brief. Um, in terms of the challenges and lessons learned from these negotiations of uh, mega regional treaties and uh, certainly the decisions that we had to adopt in terms of uh, preserving uh, old treaties, uh, coexisting with uh, new treaties. I think um, the most challenging um, issue is um, maintaining coherence and consistency across the uh, various um, investment uh, frameworks. Um, and this uh, challenging issue could only be addressed by um, a very careful uh, treaty drafting. Um, there could be instances in which a country legitimately decides that um, uh, intra-regional um, investment treaty should be preserved and should coexist with um, a new mega regional uh, legal framework. If that decision uh, is adopted, then uh, investment negotiators should embark on a, a very challenging process of treaty drafting. Um, and this uh, involves uh, going from uh, including provisions or safeguards, uh, procedural safeguards uh, provisions within the context of these investment uh, frameworks to a more substantive area um, and at attempting to clarify or providing further guidance on what has been the intent of uh, the parties throughout uh, their various investment treaties. And I will address this, uh, the procedural safeguards um, issue first. Um, I mentioned um, at the very beginning of, of uh, my presentation that one risk associated with the coexistence of um, investment frameworks is certainly uh, the possibility of a country facing parallel proceedings. Um, an ISDS claim brought by an old um, investment treaty and in parallel facing another um, investment or ISDS case under uh, modern uh, treaty provisions. Um, so the first um, uh, thing to be addressed is how can we prevent these parallel proceedings to occur? And one of the techniques that uh, Peru used to face this risk was um, by including uh, procedural safeguards in the form of this non-U-turn approach, a uh, provision that is included in um, the ISDS uh, section. Uh, so this non-U-turn approach, uh, maybe you, you are familiar with it, um, encompasses that uh, the investor that intends to bring a claim against a country should waive uh, its right to initiate or continue before any court or administrative tribunal under the law of the party or any other dispute settlement procedures, any proceeding with respect to any measure alleged to constitute a breach, a breach referred to in the investment section of the relevant treaty. You can take a look at it in the context of the CPTPP investment chapter. Um, and well, um, here the policy concern that is addressed is the issue of parallel proceedings. Um, it, for a claimant to bring a claim against a country, this claimant should waive its right to bring, to initiate, or to continue another claim uh, in the context of another um, dispute settlement procedure. Um, another area of major uh, challenge and uh, a learning process has been in the context of uh, the substantive provisions that we had included in uh, the mega regional treaties in order to address coherence and consistency. Um, you, you may take a look at uh, the recent treaty signed by Peru and you can find that uh, we have included language providing for greater clarity, for greater certainty 
this provision should be interpreted in this way. Um, and one of the major challenges that we faced when we negotiated the CPTPP was that when we were seated at the table with uh, Peru's uh, major trading um, treaty partners, uh, with whom we had already uh, trade agreements in place, treaty provisions in place. So it was a learning experience because we had the chance to revisit our shared understanding on uh, substantive provisions like national treatment, MFN, MST. Uh, and by revisiting these provisions, we could confirm the shared understanding of both parties regarding the scope and limitations of these provisions. Mm -hmm. um, parties were very interested in providing further guidance to arbitral tribunals on what has been the intent of the parties uh, in previous agreements. And that's why you could see in, in the context of these provisions, um, a wording like for, for greater clarity, for the avoidance of doubt, for greater certainty. Uh, that has been the technique that we have used to address this consistency and coherent, coherence across investment treaties. Um, and Thank I just... You. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, Nyaguti, go ahead. At 30 seconds, sorry. We, we, so we can move to talk more. Yes, another technique that I just want to, to highlight is the, uh, the inclusion of reservations uh, in the context of non-conforming measures. And I just um, want to redirect you to uh, some of the schedules that uh, Peru and other uh, treaty partners have included in the context of non-conforming measures to um, reserve the policy space to maintain differential treatment uh, with respect to investors, um, treatment that has been accorded in light of uh, previous um, investment treaty provisions. Just want to leave it uh, there in your booty. Thank you. Uh, talk about the floor is yours. Th thank you very much, Nyaguti. I'll be very brief. Um, so the, the two challenges, I'll mention the two challenges and then one, one lesson from the FCFT negotiations on the protocol on investment. Uh, the first challenge I, I would mention is the existence of different legal systems and national interests among state parties, which also makes uh, reaching consensus on specific issues or different subject matter very complicated. Um, if you look at the, the national legal systems across the continent, there are quite many, uh, plus or minus five legal systems um, that have different approaches, even when it comes to one subject matter. Uh, for example, even when it comes to how trade negotiations are negotiated or even how they enter into force, even when it comes to the termination of um, existing investment treaty, which also makes uh, things difficult. Uh, I'm not saying that consensus has to be easy uh, in terms of negotiations, but if you look at the, the coverage of the protocol on investment, um, having 55 countries uh, negotiating countries that are at different levels of development, different uh, national interest, different uh, legal systems, it also makes uh, things a bit complicated. Um, the second challenge that I would want to mention, I think Vanessa also highlighted, is the maybe the, um, the, the wave of nostalgia. Uh, you still have uh, countries that still want to keep their, skip old things of doing, uh, old ways of doing things. Maybe change is difficult, so you still have countries that still are still comfortable with the old generation of bilateral investment treaties. They still want to keep or maintain some of the controversial issues that um, the negotiations or discussions across the, the world, they are still trying to address or running away from, for example, FETs, um, uh, even asset-based definitions of investment. So that's one of the challenges that also maybe pose difficulties when it comes to to, to negotiating investment treaties. And this is one of the challenges that also the protocol is first during the discussions or when we are negotiating the protocol on investment. Um, the lesson learned or the opportunity that we have seen in the, in the negotiation of the protocol on investment is the, the political will, the level of political will among the African leaders. 
Um, and we have also capitalized and taken advantage, taken, uh, advantage of this, especially the mandate and the will to negotiate a continental, um, continental wide protocol on investment, which is legally binding. So this is the opportunity that we have also grabbed to ensure that, okay, if we have any issues, for example, addressing issues of multiple uh, regulations or obligations overlapping rules on investment, this is opportunity to address it at a continental level. And um, taking from example, the, the lesson that we have learned from the Pan-African Investment Code, which is a continental wide legal instrument, but it's not binding. So even if we try to address those issues with um, issues uh, related to overlapping memberships or issues uh, related to treaty or treaty or forum shopping, it also gets complicated because they are not legally enforceable. So we have taken advantage of that and making sure that we cover those things and we address them effectively in a legally binding uh, instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tokmo, and thank you to our panelists. Um, I think it's such an interesting discussion and uh, we're taking note we should have added more time because we're supposed to finish in one minute um, the webinar, so it's quite a challenge right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's such an interesting topic and I think uh, for the next one, we'll definitely add the time. So um, I can see that some questions actually have been addressed by the panelists, so thank you for that. And I want to encourage all the participants to have a look at the chat and Q&A and see the responses that have come in uh, to some questions. Uh, I want to kindly ask the interpreters if you could please stay on for 10, 10 15 minutes um, so that we can at least just have a Q&A and uh, close the session, if this will be okay with you. Um, so I'll kindly invite, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Um, so I want to kind of ask my colleagues, uh, Lucas and Abbas, uh, to please uh, just let us know which questions have come in and that haven't been addressed, and then we can pose them to the panelists. And at the same time, perhaps I'll ask that um, as you're responding, uh, give each of you an opportunity to give some final reflections um, so that we'll be able to be in good time. So Lucas and Abbas, uh, can you let us know which questions have come in? Thank you very much, Nyaguti. And maybe I start with the English uh, questions that have come in. Um, and I've picked three questions uh, in the interest of time. Um, the first question by Lou Bayonas is um, addressed to Yaroslav. The question is, do you have any opinion on the effects that the recent criticism and EU developments post ACMEA on ISDS in climate related cases will have on climate related dispute resolution? Then a second question, which is addressed at all panelists by Pablo Porras, who is joining us from Ecuador. Is it advisable to sign a trade agreement and then an investment agreement or vice versa? And a final question, also addressed to all panelists. What explains the early day shift or the early days shift of developing countries from opposing multilateral investment agreements to the recent trend of having mega regional investment agreements? So I will perhaps start with the question to address to me. Um, and uh, maybe before that, I just take uh, 30 seconds um, for, for my final thought. I think that uh, for my part, I would really like to highlight that this issue of the pre-existing regional BITs should be tackled proactively to ensure legal consistency and their productibility. Because this was not really done in the case of the EU, as this issue of the intra-EU investment protection uh, was there, but it was not being tackled for more than a decade after the accession of the new countries. And rather than being resolved um, at the political le level as a matter of policy, it was um, actually decided by a court which then led to further litigation, which cost both the EU investors and the member states millions of euros. And uh, the other thing is that it's important to think um, in this intra-regional context, uh, you know, whether there should be any replacement, because for example, in the case of the EU, there was no uh, comprehensive uh, re replacement for these uh, terminated BITs which uh, in practice means that, for example, the big corporations, they can uh, restructure 
and they have also more influence are better positioned to resolve their disputes with governments. But uh, it's this uh, small and medium enterprises uh, which will um, suffer um, from this lack of a framework because for them it might be too expensive to create a holding company in a third uh, state. So they will depend on national courts, which uh, even uh, you know their level of independence, even within the EU, uh, 20 member member states is not uniform. And I think that given how much we need these big investments now at the time of COVID recovery and the energy transition, um, I think it's really important to uh, reassure um, the investors about the investment protections in the EU. Um, and now um, with that being said, just to, to answer the question, uh, it is true that uh, there was a lot of uh, talks about uh, this uh, climate change litigation, particularly there are these two cases against the Netherlands by the, the German companies, which related to the closure of uh, coal power plants. Um, here, I just want to highlight that it was not, it was under the Energy Charter Treaty and not under the uh, intra-UBITs, uh, which are now uh, mainly terminated. And in case of the Energy Charter Treaty, I can note for the audience that there was now a process for about two years of modernization, which is now being decided whether it will be adopted or not. And within this process, there is now an option for the states um, to agree on a, a, a 10 year phase out of the protection of fossil fuels. So if it, this will be adopted, which is at least the EU position, um, uh, the, the fossil fuels, the current investments will be only invest, uh, protected for another uh, 10 years. And uh, with that being said, I would say that most of the disputes, for example, under Energy Charge Treaty, they in fact related to the protection of the renewable uh, investments, for example, in the case of uh, Spain, Italy, or even the Czech Republic. Um, and I think that, again, given how much the investment is needed, um, in relation to the climate change, I think that in that way, the good investment protection um, is useful because it can address, for example, the issue of the political risk. So it can actually have an impact on how much uh, on the costs of these uh, investments. It can also reassure the investors. Thank you. Thank you, Yaroslav. Um, Yonite Filalami, I'd like to give Tokmo an opportunity. I, I know he has to leave us quite soon, um, if it's okay. Uh, Tokmo, if you want to address any of the questions or give your final thoughts on, um, on this topic. Uh, thanks very much, Nyaguti. Um, I think the questions that were directed to me, I've responded in the, in, in the chat. Uh, just my final remarks, um, I'd like to say thank you to ISD for inviting us. And um, perhaps moving forward, what needs to be done in the context of this subject um, within the FCFTA is to, to provide some technical assistance and uh, sensitization to at national levels and regional levels, especially highlighting some of the benefits of terminating the existing bilateral investment treaties and having a uniform or coherent um, legal framework across the, the, the continent. And also building the, the capacity uh, for or technical support to state parties when it comes to complying with the legal domestic legal processes or requirements when it comes to the determination of bilateral investment treaties. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have to leave. I have to join another meeting. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Tokman. Thank you for joining us. Yuanita, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, okay, thank you. I think I want to respond to the question on the um, what explains the shift of the uh, developing countries from opposing multilateral and to the recent trend of having mega regional. I think this is mostly related to the growing understanding of these developing countries. Yeah, talking about ASEAN in this case that on the importance of uh, the global value chain and its um, yeah and its benefits to the developing countries so uh, and how this uh, mega regional uh, investment agreements or ftas 
could potentially allow them to actually participate in the uh, in the JVC itself. You know, so uh, I I think that's particularly one of the main reason for them to shift on uh, the policy shifting between opposing and now is um, beginning to uh, uh, participate in the multi uh, uh, mega regional uh, FTN investment agreements. Uh, I think so. I'm not just so uh, asked for the other question. I'm not. I, I'm not sure I can follow <laughs> the um. What's no problem. What that means? Um, yeah. But would you be able to share your final reflection um, on one key message? Ah, okay. Okay. Today, sure. Today, one key recommendation. Sure. Sure. Okay. So I think uh, in terms of this um, uh, mega uh, the mega regional FTN, it's um pre existing uh, uh, bilateral or plus one FTAs. Uh, it's the 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 most difficult uh having a coherence and consistency investment standard is a real challenge in having that regional FTAs uh mainly because two reasons uh different FTA partners has different sensitivity and interest so it has to be sometimes mostly uh treated with it treated differently and also uh it's also because of the changes in global, regional, national, economic, um, social, and even political environment uh, at that point in time. So it, it's sometimes when, when we have this uh, FTA sometime in uh, 10 years ago, and uh, as, as opposed to what we are having 10 years later, it might change the, 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 the political, economic, and social agenda. So it's also difficult for having a coherence and you know consistency in investment standards. So as one of the recommendation, I think uh, I, I could think of right now is perhaps as a, as a regional block, uh, we could develop uh, some kind of uh, common investment treaty model as a baseline for negotiation, at least that uh, negotiate. So as a baseline for starting a negotiation with the uh, different partner and but that could be which could be updated from time to time so we could also uh be in line or align with the um uh with the uh development of um of uh global development uh uh that in that particular time we are having a negotiation with i think um maybe that's from me Thank you, Yonita. Uh, Vanessa, uh, feel free to um, share your final reflections and perhaps um, if you want to respond to any question uh, quickly in two minutes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and thank you very much for, uh, for all uh, those questions posted by the participants. Um, as a final thought, I, I want to emphasize um, that one size does not fit all. We have heard experiences from, uh, from the European perspective, the African perspective, Latin American perspective, Asian perspective. Um, and certainly the starting point to um, address this issue of coexistence or termination of inter-regional inter uh, VITs um, would be what is uh, in the best interest of a country's um, national objectives. Uh, what are the policy uh, concerns that a country has with respect to a particular negotiation? And what are the offensive and defensive interests in a particular negotiation? So going back to the question on whether um, it is advisable to negotiate a bilateral investment uh, treaty prior to a free trade agreement or vice versa, um, I think that would depend on the country, that would depend on the needs, on the objectives of this country, and certainly on uh, the objectives with embarking on this uh, mega regional uh, trade agreement negotiation. Um, there could be instances uh, in which a country decides to embark first on the negotiation of bilateral investment treaties, as opposed to uh, initiating negotiations of pre-trade agreements. 
We may uh, recall that a uh, free trade agreement involves uh, the negotiation of provision in various areas, um, um, including environment, labor, uh, in some uh, instances, human rights uh, with some treaty partners. So um, a country must take into consideration whether negotiating uh, this whole package of provisions would be more beneficial uh, to the interests of a country than negotiating a, a stand or alone uh, investment treaty. Um, again, it's a, it's a policy question uh, to be addressed by the needs, um, particularities, and specificities of um, a country. Thank you so much. Um, Stephanie, I would like to also give you an opportunity to give a one minute if possible reflection uh, from the from sure. the two rounds of the questions coming in. Um, thanks um, a lot. Yeah, no, very briefly. I mean, this was a very rich discussion already and there's not so much that I can add. I just want to clarify that in my presentation, I did not say that RCEP has an ISDS. And so, but still the Asia Pacific region is a region where we find many overlaps. And so ASEAN plus F. TAs plus ACIA plus the bilateral intra-ASEAN um, BITs make it an overlap. And there is a point that I would like to um, link with what Tokmo said about the African investment uh, protocol is that for ACIA, it's interesting that after the conclusion in 2009, we still have bilateral investment treaties concluded by um, some states. And it's, it's in particular Singapore having new BITs, intra-ASEAN BITs um, with Myanmar and Indonesia. So the African approach of thinking also for the future in order to... Um, um, avoid overlapping commitments, I think, is a very interesting approach. And um, maybe one last point on how the European Union approach is actually not so much informing on other regions, obviously, because we have uh, here a very legalis legalistic approach to consolidation. And I was thinking maybe I should not have been so dismissive to soft consolidation within certain regions, because I think what we also can see is um, what I would call a soft consolidation. And I come back here to UNITA and ASEAN and the Asia Pacific, that ACIA is always a template for other ASEAN plus uh, agreements. And I would say that also in Africa, we can talk about a soft um, consolidation in terms of at least harmonizing between the RECs, the African RECs, and then what is being done at the continental uh, level. Um, yeah, and so with these points, um, I hope, uh, well, I was hopefully brief and uh, thanks again to all of you. And it was a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I'd just like to thank all the panelists for a really excellent uh, presentation and engagement. We are 16 minutes over time, um, so that's an indication. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Susie, who will do the uh, brief closing remarks. Uh, but thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Nyaguti. Thank you to all the panelists, to all the participants and the translator that just, uh, accepted to stay over the time. I will be very brief as compared to what was planned, just to say that this was really exciting discussion and it's illustrate the importance of this topic and the fact that one key element is for the countries to have a policy decision and discussion regarding what we want to bring as coherence and then see what is the most appropriate, efficient, cleanest and easy to implement uh, approach taking into account, of course, different specificities uh, and contexts. Uh, I hope you learn from each experience and maybe that, that um, create new ideas on the way moving forward in different regions. Uh, as we say, this is part of a world for, uh, series of webinar. We discussed it today, intra-BITs. We hope to discuss later on extra-BITs issues also. So please stay in, uh, in touch because we will share with you more information regarding our upcoming webinar. So thank you very much to all the ISD team that prepared this uh, webinar, and in particular, Nyaguti that uh, led the preparation and all the colleagues uh, joining us today. Um, and then also to the panelists, uh, thank you for your time. I wish you a nice evening or day uh, and uh, please take time to Com uh, complete the, the evaluation survey 
um, link we have shared with you right now. It will also pop up automatically when this webinar is closed. So it will take a few seconds. Please take your time to do so. And thank you again for your time. Thanks, everyone, and have a nice day.